Okay. Uh, Brent Haverly, a uh, linebacker from 02 to 06. Uh, got my degree in 07, I went five years. Um, played inside and weak side, um, or number 42. Completely 100% duck. Mom and dad uh, grew up in Florence. Uh, their first date was at a duck game. Uh, back in the wooden bleacher, you know, 10,000 people in the stand days. Um, born in Roseburg, lived in Sutherland actually, just north. Um, and for the most part, it was a, a small duck town. I mean, there's obviously the, the scattered beavers, but it was always 100%. Our whole family's uh, green and yellow. For sure. Grew up going to games. I believe used to sleep when I got tired underneath the underneath the bleachers, like underneath the seat where you know you walk by. They tuck me in there. If I, uh, you know, half the time I wasn't in my seat when I was old enough, I'd be throwing the ball around or be the annoying kid that uh, was asking for wristbands and gloves outside of the uh, outside of the locker room. So we're all guilty of that if we were duck fans growing up. Yeah, growing up I had a uh, number seven jersey, which went from Tony Hargain to Chad Cota pretty quickly, uh, and then I had the Josh Wilcox jersey. So, and it's funny now, you know, you're, 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 these are your peers now, and right. so you kind of got to harness some of it because you don't want to be that guy. When you get to the point where you make the team, you're excited to have your own jersey. You know, you're excited to be able to have the locker. And I was there in the in the phase where they 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 had the old locker room with the old yellow steel you know steel cage lockers to the new nightclub looking cherry oak you know type uh, type locker room. So at first, you're excited. I wore number 66 my first fall, and that was kind of like whatever. It was everybody made fun of it. I didn't care. I tuck it up over the pad so you couldn't really see what it was during practice. But there becomes a point where it's 365 days a year. You're putting in so much time, uh, like I said, as a walk-on at the beginning of my career, you're paying for school, you're paying for training table, I've got to have a job. M. Jacobs Furniture is one of the companies in town that a lot of the guys have worked for for decades. So, you know, thank you to Schwartz family for, for providing that. But yeah, you're putting in all these hours on the field, in the classroom, trying to provide for yourself to have a little bit of money. And then you're kind of thinking, hey, this is, uh, I'm kind of committed to that. I think I can do this as far as... You see your peers, they've recruited, they've recruited around you a couple years and you get to be about a red shirt, fresh or redshirt sophomore as a walk-on and you're like, you know what, I can do this. I know the playbook just as good as this guy. And when it comes down to it, it's 80% mental, 20% physical. Mm -hmm. And you're out there with the most gifted athletes in the world. And when you're not the most gifted athlete in the world, you gotta use your brain. And like I said, my high school coach, Bob Eggman, always said, 80% mental, 20% physical. So when you get to that point and you're so invested in it, it's like, hey, I, I'm not just here to have a jersey anymore. About three years in, I, I think I can do this. And that's kind of when you just hope for an opportunity. Luckily for me, my first year was 2002 after we had won the Fiesta Bowl um, with Joey and all those guys. So I had Dave Moretti, Kevin Mitchell, Garrett Graham, uh, Jerry Matson was a junior that year. So I had a, a stud group of linebackers to come in and kind of learn from. And uh, I would say my kind of, I, I rode the coattail of, of Mitch, Kevin Mitchell. He's one of the best undersized linebackers to come through the car. I mean, Joe, Joe Farwell, maybe from the 80s and 90s. Then it was Mitch was the 90, 2000. I mean, that was the guy. Um, at first, he probably didn't. He, I probably was this annoying little kid that, you know, blah, blah, blah. But after a while, um, just kind of, like I said, picking his brain, asking 20 questions. I'm not going to ask the coach questions because that means I don't know what I'm talking about. So I'll ask Mitch the questions. And then it ended up to dinner at his house and trips down to Orange County and all that kind of stuff. So being able to kind of emulate his style a little bit within mine, I think it was a blessing in disguise because that guy, as much as he looked like a you know the most intense guy on the field, he's such a nice guy off the field and he really took the time to work with me and, and really made me a more knowledgeable player uh, than I was ever to even think of being. But at the same time, Don Pelham, like we talked about earlier, he'll get the most out of you. There's no way you can sit in that room and not become a man uh, over the course of four or five years under his tutelage. That, that guy will get the most out of you on, in the classroom, on the field, as a man, in the community. And so you kind of got to take, you know, there's the ebb and flow there between the older guys helping you and Don, Coach Pelham's uh, tutelage. It was just a good mix for me. See, as ironic as it is, my first ever time on the field was at U of A in 03 as a redshirt freshman. 
and I kind of got juked uh, by Clarence Farmer, who was uh, All-American running back uh, for U of A. So, uh, and growing up, you know, bear down, mild cats was always one of the sayings around the house. And I have family in Phoenix and Tucson area. So being partial to Arizona and really knowing that, hey, you know, I've got to have a family influence, that was the biggest thing for me with the whole scenario. My mom, dad, brother, aunts, uncles, cousins, family, friends, we had 20 people in the stands. So that's why, you know, the scoop and score was so memorable for me. Um, but the, Mike Bell was the running back. Um, they were running this two back zone, uh, zone run stretch type of deal. And I just kind of hit the gap and I broke down to, you know, I. I I think I was in the I was in the back of a couple. I was just gonna be a nice little play, you know. I will tackle for loss, get up, celebrate. I had a good time. I celebrated a lot. And uh, next thing you know, he he dropped the ball, and it literally bounced right up into my hands. And I and I made a move on the quarterback, but that wasn't what I was worried about getting caught, because I'm I'm a four eight guy on my best day, you know, and that's at 35 yards, you know. Um, so we made a move on the quarterback, and they don't have a jumbotron on that side of the stadium. So I'm just thinking, don't get caught, bro. Just don't get caught. And I. In the end zone, right where the Oregon section was, right in front of the family, we dogpiled, um, and it was it was pretty rad just because um, it was just very surreal, just because the family was there and um, you know being down in that stadium before and, and trying to you know make a name for yourself, but at the same time it's a team effort. And when one guy goes down, our D we were number one defense in the Pac-10 that year. We had a really good defense, good up front. I mean, half of those guys are still playing in the league, which is probably the only reason why I got to play because I was playing behind Halothi and in front of Pat Chung, so I was covered, you know. But uh, just kind of got lucky, a lucky bounce, and, you know, we ended up holding them down the stretch and, and got out of there 28-21. So. I think that I won the most inspirational award uh, or most improved award in 05. And to get that was a big deal. I mean, you always look at the most improved award. Well, that means you weren't any good. Well, you know, you really, I didn't really have a chance to be good because I never got on the field. Um, so I really think it's just about getting an opportunity and, like I said, run down on those kickoffs and making plays. Anybody can run down and make a tackle if you're, you know, it's not, everybody thinks it's so hard. It's tough, but it's one of those things where this is what we've been doing. While you guys are doing what you do every day, we run down and we lift and we run and this is what we do. Um, but, I, you know, like I said, I credit it to, to, like I said, the family that I grew up in, I, I wasn't going to just be a, uh, another number. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to make something happen. But like I said, my success comes from my supporting cast. My family's awesome. You know, we have a good faith background. Um, I didn't get injured. They recruited tons of guys around me, and I'm over here helping these guys learn the defense. And people are like, well, why are you helping guys out? I'm going, well, this is a team thing. You know what I mean? This guy, we're only going to be as good as all of us, you know. And so it's one of those things where you just have to really uh, – hunker down and it's Eugene so there's not a whole lot of distraction I was close to home so that was humbled me a lot you know having mom and dad still looking over your shoulder being close to home help um, and just it's just one of those things where you get one you get one chance and I and, and, and I firmly believe that you can't Don Pelham used to say if when opportunity knocks you don't answer the door you rip the door off the hinges and you make opportunity stay and all the stuff that he had taught us you know, everything and all the older guys, it's really about the accumulation of all that in one and really grasping the moment you have. When it ha when the whole thing happened, it, it was just a, it was a weird day. You know, you do the, the walk, the march to victory where your family's there, everybody's there. My family wasn't there, they were late because grandpa had got lost. And you know, you put your shoes on, right foot, left. It was just one of those days where things were odd and awkward. Um, but coming back, it, it was one of those things where you're on the house, you're on the couch laid up watching them the next weekend at Arizona State in a dog fight. And I think, was it Ryan Turan? I don't remember the running back who they had, but it was just one of those things where you're like, it just feels like a party you was missing. And it's really, how am I going to be remembered? Uh, and there was about 11 or 12 guys out here that got hurt. Yeah. Uh, Cole Linehan had, had a broken foot. Uh, Jackie Bates, Cameron Colvin, every you know Jeremy Gibb. There was there was a, a, a AJ Tuatelli. There was a there was a big number of guys that had went down, and so it was kind of the plague that had hit. Um, with me, they had these bone stimulators, and I could take I could use one for an hour a day, and then I could take one home and sleep with it. Um, so it was. Treatment after treatment after treatment, and when it came down to it, six weeks after the break, it wasn't healed through. They took a big bone graft out of my hip to try to, you know, speed the healing up. Uh, but it came down that it was going to be senior day, and we had Arizona coming to town. 
And uh, the doctor said, yeah, you can't, you can't play, man. You may, you're not gonna be able to play to the bowl game. You know, if you break that thing, they could have to amputate it if the screws hit an arm. You know, this is not life or death, but it's, it's pretty serious. And uh, I said, well, listen, you, how long did you go to med school, sir? How long? 12 years? How long did it take you to get your degree? 8 to 12? I said, well, I've been playing ball since I was in the second grade. This is my final exam. I've got to play. So I don't know what you're going to, how you're going to clear me, but I'm walking out of the tunnel with Pops on senior day and I'm going to play. And then the next weekend was a civil war and, you know, I'll cast it up. They had a, like, I look like Met Meteor Man or Metroid or whatever with the little thing on the arm. But it was just one of those things. I needed closure. And uh, granted, we didn't win any of those games down the stretch. It was just good to get back out there and at least, you know, go down swinging. I think that being such a small town, uh, it benefits the players because they know who you are. You do get the special treatment. Um, you don't have to wait in the lines. You know, obviously we, we were Taylors and Rennies guys. I prefer Taylors. Still have the jersey up in there, thanks to Chuck. Um, but I, just the really growing up, when you leave home and then you have to start paying the bills and put your name on the E-Web or the Comcast, that's when you grow up as a man and you're learning this stuff with the guys you're going to practice with, going to school with, going to battle with. And so you really become brothers. And, you know, it's one of those things like I live with the Polynesian guys, uh, Haloti, Nada, Matoina, Inoka Lucas, uh, and then Palani Masoon, uh, Pat Sawalo later in my career. And, you know, you're coming home to six foot four, 350, and they all got their shirts off and their boxers laying on the bed giggling, playing PlayStation. I mean, that, it's just a false perception that some people have of these guys, is these guys are just monsters and fierce guys. These guys are the nicest guys in the team that had the most high, they had the high, most high pitched voice and they're giggling having the best time. Um, so being the, the you know, the, the only Holly in the house, we had, a, we had a two story, three story house with eight people living in it. I mean, you know, they were doubling up in rooms just so they could be together. So coming from a pretty tight knit family to getting to, to the O and then being around those guys, it kind of was, it was the same type of a feeling, um, but just, being able to, you know, like, like we had talked about earlier, the, the, the Blazers are in Portland and there's not another team until you get to the Bay. So really being able to kind of be, you know, somebody, be an all-star, be somebody that people recognize was awesome. I mean, you can't, you can't beat it no matter, I mean, it's just different than if you're a, a ball player in, you know, Seattle or LA, they may not know you, but you go out in Eugene and hey, you're going to get taken care of. Like, that's a big deal. Why people really latch on to Eugene. There's a lot of guys that don't leave. There's a lot of guys that stay up here from, from, from SoCal and NorCal and, you know, the East, they find it out here. It's different than what they're from. It's way more homely feeling. And like I said, you're not really a number when you're in Oregon. You're more of a person. Everybody knows your name, so it's awesome. I uh, took a year off uh, after football, uh, substitute taught. Um, and then had an opportunity to go play one more time. Uh, like I said, with the closure coming back, uh, trying to put an end on the career and move forward, a lot of guys hang on. And the, some of the best advice I received is uh, at an alumni event, one of the guys said, hey, don't chase your dream for three or four years. You're gonna be three or four years behind in the business world. Start now, the, the, your best times are behind you. If you haven't made it now, you're never gonna make it. And that's real talk from a guy I didn't even know. You know what I mean? That was just small talk. Um, you know, at an alumni event. So I, I went and played in Arkansas uh, for the Arkansas Twisters and then came home uh, after being traded to a team in Stockton and I was like, you know what, it is what it is, I'm not doing this. Uh, it was a great time, loved Little Rock, uh, but came back, I've been a freight broker for uh, the past four or five years. Um, I am taking a new job with uh, Scott's Transportation and Clifton Trucking out of Bend, uh, former defensive back Demetrius Spates. His, uh, his wife, her father, his father-in-law owns it, her, her dad. Uh, so I, you know, flatbed over the road, uh, railroad intermodal, uh, import, export through the ports, uh, shipping and transportation logistics. Um, I also had coached the last couple seasons, high school football, I coached at Blanchett Catholic in Salem. And then uh, Anthony Newman, who I do the 750 The Game radio with, he got me the linebacker gig at Central Catholic. We made a little run at the playoffs last year, almost took down the title, lost in the semis. Um, and then I train, we put on football camps, um, do some individual training. I usually mostly major with the Pop Warner, uh, middle age, middle school aged kids. Um, and it's, it's a way for me to get my itch, um, get to smell the grass and get some grass stains and kind of teach kids stuff that they don't ever think that they would ever even know. And then you watch their film. I got moms sending me DVDs of their kids, mm -hmm. sixth grade 
games and I'm going, this kid's throwing his hands and he's got good technique and he's making plays and it's like, it's, you know, it's just kind of refreshing to see that you can kind of pass down some of that stuff. But I also do radio for 750 The Game. Uh, we do a pre and post game show, the West, Bo West Coast Bank pre and post game show with uh, Jay Allen and Anthony Newman. So I still keep my foot in the door that way with media stuff so I can rub elbows with you guys in the, uh, in the skybox sometimes. Uh, but just trying to stay busy. Uh, young and single and ambitious and really excited about uh, my career and uh, really trying to take um, everything that the university molded me into and move forward and not just try to hang on but try to make something of um, everything that I learned down there in Eugene.